webinar, A Policy to Help Working Women Keep More of the Wages They Earn. My name is Jennifer Owens, and I am the Deputy Director of the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. The Georgia Budget and Policy Institute is a nonpartisan, independent nonprofit, and our mission is to build an inclusive economy where absolutely everyone can participate and thrive. We do this by providing data and analysis on a host of Georgia-specific policy issues. We believe that facts make good public policy and that good public policy can transform lives. A robust library of reports, blogs, short video briefings, and data can be found at gbpi.org. And you can keep up with us on Twitter and Facebook at GA Budget. One of our core policy priorities is to build momentum for Georgia to follow the lead of 29 other states around the country by adopting a state level earned income tax credit or Georgia work credit as we have coined the policy. And while a Georgia work credit has the potential to provide a broad swath of benefits to over a million Georgia families, our local economies, it would have a distinctly positive impact on Georgia women. For example, even with similar levels of education as men, women still face a stark pay gap. Nearly 20% of women are employed in service occupations where the typical annual earnings are barely $17,000 a year. More than half of Georgia women are employed in two of Georgia's lowest paying fields. This means that women working in low wage occupations would be well served with a tax policy targeted to help them keep more of the wages they earn, such as the case with the current federal earned income tax credit, which would be bolstered by the potential of a Georgia work credit. Today, we'll be diving into that policy, how it works, how it would benefit working women in Georgia, and how you can get involved in the ever-growing Georgia Work Credit community. I am joined today by Helen Robinson, the Advocacy Director for the YWCA of Atlanta. In her role, Helen runs the wildly popular and successful Georgia Women's Policy Institute, a fellowship program that has several years experience and a very successful track record training women to engage effectively on public policy issues. I want to thank Helen and the YWCA for being long-standing partners of GBPI. So before we dive in, just a few housekeeping notes. While these webinars are convenient, they also lack that authentic interaction that we have when we look at each other in person in a room. So we are going to try and capture some interactivity throughout the course of the webinar. To that end, I want to draw your attention to the field below the slide screen that you're seeing where you should see a question box. This will be available for use throughout the webinar, and we will have ample time at the end of the prepared remarks to address any outstanding questions or ideas. So before we move on, let's have a quick practice round to make sure everyone can locate the question box and is comfortable using it. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and type in your name or the name of the organization you are representing today on the call in that question box. We're gonna give this just a few seconds. Make sure folks can get messages in. Going once, going twice. All right, excellent. Here's a look at our learning objectives for our time today. You can expect to become an expert on the earned income tax credit, which has great potential to further support working women in Georgia, including why, why and how a Georgia work credit would have notable benefits for women in Georgia. And finally, if you don't put that good information and expertise to use, we aren't doing this right. So we will also share some specific opportunities to put your newfound expertise into action to help the Georgia work credit campaign move forward. So with that, let's start from with some basics. The Federal Earned Income Tax Credit, or EITC, is the foundation for what we hope to build a Georgia work credit upon. So it's important we have a basic understanding of what the federal policy looks like. Put simply, it is an income tax credit that benefits workers, especially parents. Families that make a certain amount of income can reclaim some of their wages through the credit. And for many families, it's a substantial credit, providing up to a few thousand dollars a year, which helps to stabilize family finances and put families on a path to the middle class, including being able to provide a better environment for kids. It's considered one of, if not the most effective federal anti-poverty program. And historically, it's enjoyed mostly bipartisan support. 
It was created in 1975, and it has grown over time with expansions under Presidents Reagan, Clinton, George W. Bush, and President Obama. Certain aspects of the credit were expanded during the Great Recession, and those improvements were recently made permanent by a bipartisan tax bill in Congress. One of the reasons for this historical bipartisan support is because the EITC is designed to encourage people to enter the workforce, work more hours, and increase their wages. Because you don't get it if you don't work. Studies show that the EITC encourages large numbers of single parents to leave welfare for work, especially when the labor market is strong. Specifically, a highly regarded study found that the EITC expansions are the most important reason why employment rose among single mothers with children during the 1990s. The EITC was more effective in encouraging work than either welfare reform or the strong economy. In 2016, the EITC lifted about 5.8 million people out of poverty, including 3 million children. The number of poor children would have been more than one quarter higher without the EITC. In Georgia, the federal EITC benefits more than a million Georgia families each year, or roughly 28% of all Georgia households. And just as the recipients represent broad groups of people, the geographic extent of the benefits are just as broad, with the families receiving the credit coming from all over the state, as opposed to being concentrated in one or two places. This means it's a critically important tool for rural families and rural economies as well. So very briefly, let's walk through the mechanics of how the EITC works. And this is where you are going to become a quick expert. Whether you get the EITC and the size of the tax credit varies depending on three specific factors. Your household income, the number of children you have, and to a lesser extent, your marriage status. Families start to gain access to the credit as their income grows from zero. The credit plateaus in value when that family begins making between $10,000 and $25,000 a year, and then the benefit gradually tapers off as families get closer to the middle class mark. This design has proven over recent decades to be enormously effective at helping families work their way up the economic ladder and transition into self-sufficiency. Case in point, about 60% of recipients receive the credit for only one to two years at a time. But let's put this chart in human form so you can see what those lines mean to actual people. Here's how the credit pulls up a minimum wage worker above the poverty line. In this case, a single mother. Here's a family a bit above poverty already, but not quite yet to where they want to be in terms of being self-sufficient and financially secure. And finally, here's an example of a family that has climbed the ladder near to the middle class, in which case their tax credit is beginning to phase out. So especially for families exiting poverty and moving closer to the middle class, the EITC can be quite substantial. But one thing you might be asking yourself is, would families at that level of income even owe that much to begin with? And that gets to what is one of the most important things about the EITC to understand, which is that families get to receive the full value of the credit, even if it exceeds their income tax bill. This is known as refundability. Imagine those young parents with two kids making roughly $29,000 a year through a couple of part-time jobs. Based on their income, marriage status, and number of kids, their federal EITC was roughly $4,400. If the EITC didn't exist, this family would owe ballpark $830 in federal income taxes. But with the EITC, they get a refund instead of roughly $3,500. It's designed this way so that it's effectively a wage boost to the take-home pay for workers earning low wages, and also so that it offsets some of the other taxes they pay, such as sales tax, gas taxes, property taxes, and fees. What you're looking at now is a summary of what families generally do with the money. And the evidence is fairly clear that families do one of four things generally. They use it to pay down debt, such as make car payments or payments on overdue utility bills. 
They stabilize their short-term finances so that they can better afford the basics like healthy food and school supplies. And because it comes as a refund and a large sum, families can make big purchases, such as place a security deposit down on a place in a safe neighborhood or, make a, or buy a reliable car to get to work. Many families use this as an opportunity to put away some money in a savings account or start a college account for their children. And families, of course, will use some of their refund for other types of purchases, driving dollars and activity into local businesses and into our local economy. And because the EITC has been around so long, there has been and continues to be so much research studying its impacts and its effectiveness on all kinds of things. Here we see a near life cycle long set of benefits to having that little bit of extra money at critical times in our lives. We will provide links to these studies in the follow-up materials after the webinar for further reading. It is also true that the gains from the EITC don't stop at the individual recipient or her family, but spill over into the community and the economy at large. Now that you are all newly minted experts in this tax policy, I'm gonna turn it over to Helen Robinson to walk us through how this tax policy provides a significant benefit to women specifically. Helen? Thank you, Jennifer. And I am here to talk about how sound tax policy, just like equal pay or maternal health, is a women's issue. The YWCA of Greater Atlanta, as we change the slide, we advocate for state level policy that can improve the lives of women and girls in Georgia. And we encourage more women to get involved in the policy process because we believe that that is a strategy to achieve better public policy. And the photo that you see here are women and our male allies at a recent lobby day that we held at the state capitol in support of a state earned income tax credit. So why do we work at the YWCA on state level policy? A lot of what we hear in the news is about federal policy, and we just heard a lot of great information about the federal EITC. But state policy matters. State policy has a direct impact on the day-to-day -day lives of women and girls in Georgia. And state policy solutions can improve the health and safety and the economic empowerment of all women and girls in our state. So that is why women need to be at the table when policy decisions are being made at the Georgia General Assembly, either serving as advocates or as elected officials. And I do wanna take a moment to point out that in Georgia, women are dramatically underrepresented in state level elected office. There are currently no women elected to statewide office in Georgia. And of our 236 state legislators, only 27% are women. Now we did recently have a net increase of three women in our state Senate last year, and we will need to adjust these numbers, of course, after the November 2018 election. And a record number of women are running in Georgia and nationally. And by my calculation in the November election, over half of the competitive state legislative races that will be on the ballot have at least one woman running. So we are definitely moving in the right direction. But just as important as having women in elected office in our state is having women showing up at the state capitol as advocates. And there has been a surge of women getting engaged in policy advocacy in our state as well. And as one small sign of that, there are now 100 alumni of the YWCA's Georgia Women's Policy Institute. This is a year long training program where diverse women learn how to become effective advocates for state level policy. This is a picture of fellows presenting to the Women's Caucus, which is a bipartisan group of women legislators in the Georgia General Assembly. And I know some alumni from this program are participating in the webinar today. And for multiple years, the economic empowerment team of the GWPI has chosen the state earned income tax credit as their policy focus. And they have done that voluntarily. A lot of people joke with me that you must have made them choose tax policy because why would a group of women choose that of all the things they could work on? Well, I'm going to convince you of 
why that was a great choice for them. So first we start with the data. When you look at the economic status of women in Georgia, we know that at the current rate of how things are going, Georgia women will not achieve equal pay until 2057. And of course, women of color experience even greater disparities in pay. Women have lower earnings due to a number of factors, including the fact that occupations that are performed mainly by women tend to have lower pay. The fact that the lack of paid family leave and supportive policies like that in our state disparately impact women workers. And of course, we can't forget just outright discrimination in compensation, recruitment, and hiring of women. We also need to know that the percent of women in poverty in our state is growing and that Georgia ranks in the bottom 10 of all states on this measure. And you may have seen recently in the AJC that Georgia's economy as a whole is ranked the ninth best in the nation by Wallet Hub. We often hear those type of statistics which present a very rosy picture of our state, but it is not the whole picture. And we know that women disproportionately work in lower wage jobs, are more likely to live in poverty, are more likely to make minimum wage, or work in jobs that rely on tips. And that tells us that any policy that reduces poverty and supports, and supports lower wage workers is a women's issue. And finally, we know that over half of all Georgia families with children in the household have mothers as breadwinners. And what that means is they are either single mothers supporting the family or they're married and are bringing in at least 40% of the total household income. What that tells us is that economic policy that impacts women impacts everyone in our state. So we start with the data and next we look at what types of state level policy can improve these numbers. So state level legislation can do a lot of things to help women's economic empowerment. It can encourage family friendly workplaces. It can encourage equal pay for women. It can prevent sexual harassment on the job, provide greater access to affordable childcare for working women. And it can move more women into non-traditional careers that pay much more because they are male dominated. And last but not least, we can enact state level tax policy that helps low wage workers. And that leads us to the idea of creating a state level earned income tax credit. Thanks, Helen. What you're looking at now is a map of the country that shows you 29 other states plus the District of Columbia that have established their own state versions of the earned income tax credit to layer on top of the wildly successful federal earned income tax credit that we talked about briefly just now. There are two things to know about a state EITC or a Georgia work credit, and this is noted in the colors that you're looking at on the map. They take two forms. Some are refundable, which means that they spill over into a refund check, even if the family's uh, credit is more than the tax bill that they owe. But there are also a few states, four in particular, six in particular, that have non-refundable credits. The second thing to know is that state earned income tax credits are based on a percent of the federal credit. So for example, a 10% state earned income tax credit would come back to the family in a 10% value of their federal earned income tax credit amount. So let's take a look at what this means in real dollar terms and by using those examples that we looked at before. This is that single mom that we met earlier. Her average credit and, and what it looks like broken down by percents. Here's that married couple working a few paid part-time jobs, what their federal credit looks like, and what would be layered on top with a state percent match. And finally, here's that last family that was climbing the ladder, moving into the middle class. Their federal earned income tax credit was beginning to phase out and what their state level match would look like on top of that. 
So Helen, why don't you walk us through some Georgia specific benefits of the credit for women here? So a state level earned income tax credit would be family friendly tax reform, reform that can empower more women to move into the middle class. And we believe it would impact 900,000 working women in Georgia. And that would be all over the state, including office workers, uh, women in retail sales, women in food service, allied healthcare workers. And as Jennifer mentioned earlier, the state earned income tax credit would help working women take on extra hours of work because it would make it worth it for them to do so. And of course, it would help these women pay for necessities for themselves and their families. So you may ask yourself, what would an extra, let's say 300 or even $400 a year, what could that help a working woman pay for? And remember, this would be the amount that you would get on top of your federal EITC if we had a state EITC. Well, I imagine she could use it for after school care, healthy food, that small car repair that will be the difference between her, be her being able to get to work that week or not. She may return as a student and get some books, books paid for, and she could make those critical visits to get prenatal care if she's an expecting mom. And you could imagine that this could mean the difference between her having the ability to leave an abusive partner. Research also shows that half of families in Metro Atlanta do not have $400 to cover an emergency expense. So we know that that can mean a lifeline to a working family. And that really puts the amount of the state EITC in perspective, I think. And the benefits just keep on coming. With the state EITC, we could improve educational outcomes for children. And we have research that shows that states that have implemented an EITC have improved infant health. And we can predict that Georgia could realize an 8.4% decline in babies being born at low birth weight if we enact a state EITC. And because it makes working and working those extra hours actually pay off, it will boost social security benefits for women when they retire. And we know that that can play a major role in reducing poverty among elderly women in our state. So we've walked through very briefly a lot of benefits of the EITC over the years. And I just wanna draw attention to some examples where states are really using it to innovate and address critical issues in very creative ways. And I wanna take a minute to just share uh, what's happening in Massachusetts right now. This year, the Massachusetts legislature passed a budget that included an unprecedented provision to expand the earned income tax credit so that domestic violence survivors um, can access additional funds. Under the new provision, Massachusetts adopted language that will maintain EITC eligibility for these survivors regardless of their tax filing status. Research shows that rates of domestic abuse are higher among those living in poverty compared to wealthier households. In addition, women who experience severe aggression are more likely to be unemployed and experience physical and other problems. Expanding EITC eligibility for domestic abuse survivors provides a safety net and helps them achieve financial independence from their abusive partners. So that's just an, one example of where a state has really innovated their state earned income tax credit to address a critical issue at play. So where are we on following the lead of the 29 other states, including our neighbor, South Carolina, on instituting such a policy here in Georgia? For the last two years, we've been building the education and awareness around the idea and promoting a Georgia work credit. To date, we have educated members of the Georgia General Assembly, local governments, important community leaders, and worked alongside a collection of very diverse organizations, including the YWCA of Atlanta, the Atlanta Community Food Bank, Buckhead Christian Ministries, the Junior League, the Center for Working Families, Georgia Watch, Working Women to 9 to 5, Step Up Savannah, and many others to lift up this important policy issue that our state elected leaders should consider. We've established an informational hub at georgiaworkcredit.org where you can go and access county and legislative district level fact sheets that you can share with your community. 
You can share your story there, and you can also read research and keep up with blogs that you can send to members of your organization or write a letter to your state representative or state senator. And over the course of the last two years, we've made some pretty incredible progress, though we're not there yet. In 2017, a non-refundable version of the state or income tax credit was added to a big tax package at the hand of the Republican chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. While the bill did not ultimately pass, it was a huge sign that our collective education efforts were paying off. And in both 2017 and 2018, we saw bills on both the House and Senate side calling for a Georgia Work Credit. Most recently, we understand there is support and interest from a number of Republicans and Democrats for this policy idea. It has been very important for our strategy to honor the bipartisan history of the EITC and ensure we are building support on both sides of the aisle for such a policy. And here's where we really are looking for folks to contribute. Number one, stories. In states that have effectively informed the policy debate and gotten a state earned income tax credit passed, women in particular have shared their stories with local elected officials in the district as well as at the Capitol. In Montana, for example, women were a huge force in getting their state EITC passed. We need more voices speaking up and can work alongside you or your organization to share your story in an effective and easy way. Number two, we need help with simple education to state lawmakers. Many state legislators have not been recipients of the earned income tax credit or realize that states around the country have had so much success adopting a state version of the tax credit. Simple education through a letter, an email, or a quick meeting around your community would go a long way in driving the need and serving uh, as an education force to those lawmakers. We are very optimistic that whoever becomes the Republican nominee for governor will join the Democratic nominee who's currently calling for a state earned income tax credit. We also understand that there is interest on both sides of the aisle to file legislation to establish a state earned income tax credit in January 2019 when the legislature reconvenes. So to be honest, our time is now to elect, educate our elected officials and encourage them to look closely at this policy. With that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions and discussion. Just a reminder that that question box is below the slide screen and you can type your questions in at any time. We will do our best to field as many as we can. And if there are any that come up that we can't field here live on the webinar, we will be able to provide a follow-up in the email and follow-up materials. So the first question that's come in is, uh, will women voters, have, women voters have a lot of power this year? How should we leverage that on issues like the earned income tax credit? Sure, I, I agree. Women voters will have a lot of power this year. I'm very excited about that. And I think that one of the things that we can do is talk about the earned income tax credit and a state level version coming to our state. You can talk about it to candidates. You can bring it up in their forums. You can meet with them individually and tell them how important this is. And remember that this may be something that you can provide, so now that you've been through this webinar, provide a little bit of simple education to candidates who are running for your, your state leg legislative districts um, and make them know how important this is to women specifically. I think that's great, Helen. The other thing I would offer is make sure candidates at any level are talking to you as talking to us as women about our pocketbook issues, which are just as important as all of the other issues that fall under the big umbrella of what are considered women's issues. At the end of the day, we're working, we're raising families, we're building careers, and economic and tax policy issues impact us just as much, if not more, as the other issues. And I would really uh, encourage everyone to make sure that candidates are talking to us about those issues and are educated about how some of these policy issues can impact women and our families. Next question, any tips for convincing my friends that this is an important women's issue? Yes, I would hope some of the GWPI fellows could probably answer that question if they were able to speak on the webinar. But I think that, as Jennifer said, ask them, you know, do you do you work? Do you know working women? Do you see working women uh, in the stores you go in, um, you know, in, in the healthcare facilities that you go in that could benefit from this? You know, 
make it make it personal and talk about the stories. I think Jennifer did a great job of actually giving you examples of you know a single working mother, um, a married uh, couple with children. Give real examples to your friends about people that that they may know who could benefit from this, and then all of the side benefits that you get as a working woman in terms of health care, in terms of uh, your childhood, your child's educational outcomes, all of the things that come along with the, the simple monetary benefit of a state EITC. The only other tip I would offer is that um, we achieving equal pay and achieving uh, closing the wealth and income gap is not going to happen overnight and it is not going to happen through the course of one piece of legislation. And I would offer that Things that walk us along that path to achieve that ultimate goal, like a state earned income tax credit, are worthy milestones for us to be both pursuing, advocating for, and achieving as we all work to achieve the big goal of equal pay and closing both the equal, the income and the wealth pay gap. I love that question. We have just a few more. Could you share more about the growing role of women as breadwinners for their family? Well, I th yes, I think it's growing, but has also been in existence um, for a while now. It's just a matter of everyone recognizing that when you're talking about empowering women economically, you are very frequently talking about empowering families, that there are children who rely on women's income. Um, so, so we have to get away from any old fashioned notions that we, that we, um, are not talking about entire families and children when we're talking about women's wages. And if we want to help grow our state's economy and to continue to be in the top of the list that we see in the media, we really need to be talking about women and women as breadwinners. One of the things that we can send out in the follow-up is a report that the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute did um, called the An Economic Opportunity Agenda for Georgia Women that really walks through some of the data and trends behind women in the workplace and some policies, including the EITC, that can really be used to lift up the economic, um, lift women up the economic ladder. Next question, is there more data about the economic impact of the state EITC to show it's an important investment? I would offer that there, we have more data on the EITC than we know what to do with. <laughs> Um, there is at the georgiaworkcredit.org website a, a lot of data that you can sift through. We are going to send out some additional reports and studies in the follow-up to this webinar. And I would also offer that there is um, really a new body of research developing around the state earned income tax credit research in particular. As those credits have been in place in states now over time, there's a lot more um, uh, data to pull from to be able to, to, to do some nice research. In particular, there's a study here out of Emory University that Ellen referenced that really showed the link between state earned income tax credits and their impact on infant birth weights as well as some other measures related um, to, uh, to maternal and infant health. And so we can provide all of that um, and send that back out to you, but the answer is absolutely yes. The other thing I would like to mention on the georgiaworkcredit.org is that there's very localized information. So if you are down in Thomasville, um, you are able to pull up your county level and legislative district level information that shows how this kind of credit would impact said number of families in and around Thomasville, as well as how much money would go back into the community in and around Thomasville. Next question, last question. This offers a great support to families retroactively. This may be a little broad, but can we as a state or as policy advocates do to financially support challenged families proactively? That's a great question. I think it is a great question. And, and I would go back to, uh, again, some of the state level policies that are so important, especially to working women and those families that have women as breadwinners include providing access to affordable childcare. So we need more locations for childcare and we need them to be affordable. And the state can provide additional funding for subsidies for that. Um, again, 
anything that can improve family friendly policies at workplaces um, from paid maternity and paternity leave to paid sick leave, uh, anything that can advance equal pay for women. There's another study, um, we keep mentioning all the data that's out there, there's another study that shows you could cut poverty in half by giving women equal pay. So what can our state do to work on that? Um, you know, one thing that has been really creative that I've seen in a couple of other states is, is simply making it illegal for companies to ask what you used to make in your previous job when they're interviewing women because that's how we break that cycle. Um, again, as I mentioned, getting women into, into non-traditional careers so that they are not, uh, especially in, for example, vocational um, education being shut, shuttled into jobs that are female dominated and lower pay. How do we break that cycle? Great. Um, and uh, just speaking broadly, I'll just draw attention to a few other things. Um, so uh, there is a role and there is momentum at the state level to look at ways to make college more accessible and affordable for families, particularly for students that are coming um, from, um, from low-income families. And they may be adult students. This might not necessarily mean the 18-year-old coming out of high school. This last state legislative session, uh, legislation was passed and signed by the governor to create the state's first ever need-based financial aid program. You all are probably familiar with our HOPE programs that are merit-based, which means you have to hold some kind of GPA and other requirements. This would be a need-based aid program that would be available to students. That legislation passed but has not yet been funded. So moving forward into 2019 and beyond, there's some work to do to make the case that this is funding that the state should be investing in so that students have access to aid um, to be able to, to seek a degree, finish a degree, or gain a credential. The other thing related to that is momentum around the country to make technical school tuition free. And there is a lot of interest um, and some, um, some attempts at doing that currently in the state. And that might be another idea to expand access to help families and women in particular get the training skills and credentials they need to get a higher paying job. Second, I'll mention healthcare. Healthcare costs and healthcare access in general is an issue for everybody, frankly, regardless of your income. And right now, Georgia is one of just a handful of states left in the country that has not expanded our Medicaid or our Medicaid program so that women, you know, are able to access some level of affordable coverage. And that is something that the state is poised to do, is able to do, and would have a host of benefits, not just on the economic development side, but also so that women can access some affordable health care options. The uh, last thing I'll mention, and, and Helen touched on this, and that is the need for more attention and funding in the state's current child care subsidy program, or CAPS, Child and Parent Services. Many states around the country um, have done some very innovative things to expand access and eligibility and make sure women, in particular women, that want to work or want to go to school can make sure their children are somewhere that is a quality learning environment and that they are safe and secure while that woman goes to, to get a credential, go to school, or go to work. Georgia currently serves 8% of the eligible low-income population with our current subsidized child care program. That is a huge opportunity to make sure that parents can get access to what they need so that they can go to work and be successful and earn the wages that they need uh, to move their family out of poverty and up the income level with of course the added benefit of having you know young children in very high quality early learning environments so extending aid for um, need-based aid and making technical school tuition free making sure that everyone in the state can afford health care and having access to what we call work support so that families and women that want to work can do so um, are other sort of more broad policy efforts that are underway and there is momentum and interest around in addition to, of course, the ones that Helen laid out. So on behalf of GBPI and the YWCA of Atlanta, I just want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to send out a recording of this webinar as well as some of the supplemental materials that we have mentioned throughout. In the meantime, if you want to engage or have an idea, please